So I wanted to talk about connection between baristas, but also uh, a few different kinds of connection that we have in our industry. I think it's uh, one of the most powerful things that is happening now that didn't used to happen is, is how we can talk to each other very directly across lots of different ways. Um, but one of the ways when you, when you are talking to people, you're meant to introduce yourself and build a connection between the audience and yourself so you know who I am. So I thought I'd tell you a little bit about what I've done in coffee or where I've come from in coffee. Uh, so right now, I work as a salesman. I work for a small roastery in the middle of England. Uh, we're not based in London, we're not cool. Uh, we're not expensive either. <laughs> but uh, my job is to uh, find new cafes that want to serve good coffee, help them find equipment, help them find the right coffee for them and their customers. I will train, I will do deliveries, uh, installation. I am not a specialist, I am a generalist. And I do a little bit of everything, not quite as well as I would like to do it. But I found this job uh, through being a barista. And if I define who I am and what I do, I, I make coffee. I enjoy making coffee for people. Uh, my first job in coffee was working for a chain, uh, wiping tables, and it was hard work. But it was fun because I had this opportunity to work with something that I was really excited about. Uh, I had tasted good coffee, and I knew that it was possible, but I wasn't able to do it. Because I grew up in a really small town. The, the town I grew up in was maybe 8,000 people. And I moved to the biggest city nearby, which was Bristol, which is like 500,000 people. And there, there was one good shop, it wasn't very good, but it was the one good shop, so I got a job there. And nobody knew what they were doing. The first week, I learned how to uh, use the table cleaning chemical in the cheapest possible way, which is you spray on the cloth and then wipe it with the cloth. <laughs> Not it's bad. And then in the second week, I was allowed to use the till. I was allowed to touch money, which was scary. And then in the third week, I could touch the coffee machine. And they showed me how to uh, turn on the grinder and you pull the lever twice. If you pull the lever twice, it's the right dose for one coffee. And then you insert it and you push go and it tasted horrible. And there was, there was this big problem because I loved the idea of coffee. I loved the idea that it was this delicious thing and complex and it came from somewhere else. And I knew that it could taste good, but nobody in the cafe knew how to do it. So my first job was to try and find somebody who would show me. And the cafe had a trainer uh, who worked at head office and came around once a month. And so I was like, OK, this is what they've shown me. It doesn't work. <laughs> what am I doing wrong? And so I spent the next week with the, with the trainer learning how I was meant to do it and making the product a bit better. And it tasted better when I understood how time had an impact and how if I tamped properly, it had an impact. But I still didn't really understand anything. I could make the coffee taste better than it did, but not better enough. And I felt really alone. I felt like I was the only person in that business who wanted it to taste good because everybody else had a different priority. And I felt lost and alone for a long time. And the only thing that I had that I can make things better was Google. Google is really helpful. And if you Google, my coffee tastes bad, you can find 100,000 people who are a long way away, <laughs> but also think it matters that the coffee tastes good. So I started reading blogs and looking at what people were doing in cafes in, at that time, mostly in Australia or in America and some in London, and started realizing that there was a community of people who shared the same values as I had, it's just I wasn't near them. And for me, this was a problem because I wasn't learning anything. So I read all the Googles, I read all the things I could find, and the next step I could see the place was to go to a place where there were lots of people making coffee, 
which was a trade show. And I hate trade shows. I didn't know that I would hate them, but I went to my first trade show, and it wasn't like this. It wasn't lots of nice people and lots of nice coffee in a small space. It was, uh, it was a big exhibition center selling catering equipment, so ovens and ice cream makers, and then a corner of espresso machines and men in suits trying to sell them to me. And I had no money, and all I had were, was questions that they couldn't answer. And I couldn't find where I was meant to go from there, but I walked into a room, and there was a barista competition. And there were people very seriously in aprons with brushes, uh, cleaning up as they went, and they had a big timer, and I could see that there was something happening there. And it was exciting, and it was interesting. And after each round of drinks, some of the, like the, the half-drunk signature drink on the tray came into the audience, and I could taste, wow, so this is coffee mixed with this thing, and I don't know why they would do that. It isn't that nice, but it's different. And then taste a bit of the espresso, and begin to taste different coffees made by different people. And then afterwards, very nervously, I was like, hello, <laughs> where do you work? Where do you come from? And I found that these people, uh, these people who had found the stage and could go and compete were actually just as alone as I was. They were, they were trying to do this thing and trying to find a community, and maybe some of them worked in a bigger city so they knew more people and there were more connections for them to make. So they were a little further along and they were sharing good ideas a little faster than I'd been able to. And then there were some who were from small villages and they just, they knew a little bit more than me and they really wanted to make good coffee. So they had gone to compete to do that. So I thought, well, this may be a route for me. So over the next year, I started traveling to some of the cafes where those people had been. I went to a cafe right in the very corner of the UK in Cornwall, in a place called Wadebridge, where the, the, the national champion worked. And he was really happy to see me because I was a coffee person. And it was a long journey for most people to get there, and most of his customers were not coffee people. But most of his customers really got that he was a coffee person and that they went into his cafe because the coffee tasted nicer and because he was passionate. So we spent an afternoon talking about coffee, and he was making coffee with me, and I got to make coffee with him, I got to talk to his customers. And so that's, a, that's another kind of connection, and it's, it's one I'll come back to because it's probably the most important in our industry is the connection between the barista and the customer. Uh, so I got to speak to his customers, and they got to see that Hugo, who was the champion, was not the only weird person, that there were other people like him and, uh, and that was exciting for them, so they, so they got to talk about coffee with someone else, and they got to learn something. So I then started competing, I started getting ready for the competition, and there was a training event where everyone could go and start talking to each other and, and understand the rules so they could prepare well. And I met some other competitors who I'd be competing with. Uh, I met a girl who was from, uh, the other side of Wales, we were the same region, but we got, to, we got to talk and we were both in the same place and we got to start practicing together. And this was 2000 and 2009, uh, so five, six years ago. And now uh, I sell coffee and Estelle sells coffee machines. She works for La Mazzocco now. She is the espresso ambassador. And over the last five, six years, we've built a really good friendship that came from the early stage of competition. And I have other friends who I also met at the same time who are also have gone on the same journey over the last five, six years. Uh, John, uh, who was actually filming the competition that year but, but was also competing, and then he later became the UK champion. Now he is living in New Zealand. He's about to get married this month, and, and his, uh, his soon-to-be wife works in coffee. and. They went to work at a roastery, so I got to visit a different roastery and see different ideas about coffee. And through them, I met Steve, who is now my boss. So John was saying, well, you know, if you want to compete, you should use good coffee and you should taste as much good coffee. So here's this guy who's very strange. 
in the middle of the country who really likes barista competition, who really likes different coffees, and maybe there's a good fit there. So through my connection to John, I made a connection to Steve. And Steve has been really uh, important in my life, has given me opportunities to learn and grow in different ways. So I got to see a lot more of roasting, and eventually he trusted to give me a job. And now I get to grow his business, which is really exciting for me because we have such a strong friendship and we, we share these ideas. Every event I've gone to, I've made new friends, but I've also met new trainers, new people to learn from. Uh, and I've also learned, one of the big things I've learned is that it isn't always the people in authority or the people who stand on the stage who are the most useful. Normally the best trainers are the people who share your situation. So the people in the audience with you, or if you're working bar at the espresso station down there, the other people working bar from another roastery or from another country. I find uh, when I'm doing training work in an espresso bar, the ultimate goal is quality, but also efficiency. Because the more efficient you are, the more consistent you are, the more streamlined your process is, the easier it is to allow repeatability and control consistency. So the easier it is to achieve quality for all your customers. When we're in a small community, so I don't know how big the coffee community in Prague is. I know it's growing. I can see it's growing and there are lots of good people. And there will be a feeling that you are all doing similar things and you will be learning from each other. But it's terribly inefficient that the baristas in Prague are learning all these lessons in a really hard way by trial and error when the baristas in Poland or the baristas in Berlin or the baristas in London are also learning the same things very slowly. But if we can share ideas faster and be that by one barista from your cafe traveling to London and spending a week there and seeing different things. Or by one barista in each cafe really spending time to read every blog and then share it, which is the hard part. So they read the blog with a new idea and they go back to their cafe and instead of doing it at home on their own, doing it with their colleagues and saying, this is what I read, maybe it's crazy, but if we brew with twice as much water, will it taste better? Or if we weigh every shot on the scales before we insert it, will we waste less? Or if we try to get hold of this new grinder that my friend is using in Budapest or using in wherever, maybe we can do something different but better. I find that really exciting. And the internet lets that happen really easily. So now, I've been very lucky, I've made lots of connections, I've made connections in lots of bars and lots of communities. I know that if I go to most cities in Europe, I will find one person that I know from Twitter or I know from Instagram that I can go to their cafe and I can say, so where else should I go? Who else should I talk to? And they will show me around that we can both make friends and I can take the connections I make there and when I get home and I get to a cafe, and somebody else is traveling somewhere, I can say, well, you should really check out this place. When you are on holiday in uh, Nuremberg, you should visit this roastery, and you should talk to these people because they will introduce you to other new ideas. Uh, the, next, the next stage of connection that I wanted to talk about is that because of the internet, because we all, many of us have smartphones now, we're not just limited to the contacts that we can make day to day. So we're not limited to just the customers we meet or the people who come into our bar from another place. We also have the ability to talk to people we've never met and talk to people in other parts of the coffee industry that we don't touch directly. So for me, I work in a roastery. I can find very good contacts with green coffee suppliers, with importers, but actually finding a farmer is difficult if I do things the old way. The old way is you're a barista, so you buy your coffee from your supplier. Your supplier is a roaster or a distributor, and they will buy it 
their coffee for the roastery, they'll buy it from an importer. The importer will have relationships with maybe an exporter in Colombia or Brazil and, and collate those things. And it's a very linear line that the coffee follows this cycle. But now with things like, particularly things like the Cup of Excellence, when the Cup of Excellence auction is finished and you know where the coffee came from, there is an email address with uh, farmers like, uh, we ran the Barista Guild camp in Greece this year and we had a farmer called Graciano Cruz uh, who runs farms in Panama and some work in El Salvador. Um, he, he passed his email address out and he wants to talk to baristas because he knows that the connection he can make directly with them will sell more coffee for him because the people who are serving customers will be saying, oh, this is a guy who is really driving things forward and has new ideas and we want to taste his coffee and we want to share his coffee with you. And for the barista, there's this opportunity to learn more about the stuff we're working with from a completely different angle. So very recently, we've been doing lots of work with a few farmers on processing. And as a barista, we feel very educated because we know there is wet processing and there is natural processing and then there is honey and pulp natural processing in between. And it all seems very exciting but also quite simple because you can read a book and you can understand what natural processing means. But if you can talk to a farmer or somebody who processes day in, day out, you suddenly find out that natural processing is as complicated as brewing a Chemex, that there are a hundred ways of doing it and a hundred different control points where if the farmer does it like this, the flavor will be different or the result will be different or the consistency will be different. And you can suddenly understand by asking questions of that farmer and then tasting some of their coffee and they are happy to share coffee. <laughs> they are happy to send coffee anywhere. Uh, you can suddenly begin to understand the implications of those changes of processing and develop your understanding of what that can mean. So when you taste three naturals from Ethiopia or three naturals from Colombia, you can begin to understand what might be the cause of that. And then there's that, that final connection, the most important connection, which is your connection with the customer. Everybody, everybody who comes into your cafe might not want to know everything about coffee. That's okay. In the, the village where I grew up, most of the customers do not want to know the full story about coffee and that's okay, but they do appreciate tasty coffee. If it tastes nice, they like it better often. But they all share one thing, which is they do want to be noticed. When a customer comes in and you ask them, ask them a question, like what do they want? They want you to listen to them and they want you to give them what they want. And so being able to listen and being able to really notice somebody and connect with them is really powerful. And people remember it. So if you're a customer and you go to 10 cafes and you order coffee and you get coffee and it's nice, it's fine. But if you go into a cafe and you remember that the barista stopped and spent some time with you or really listened to what you wanted and gave it to you, you are more likely to go back and you are more likely to ask questions and the barista who is uh, cultivating that connection, but also cultivating the connections they have with other baristas and other parts of the industry, is able to tell really good stories about the coffee. So if you know more about processing because you've spoken to farmers, or you know more about the logistics of coffee because you've spoken to your importers, or you've spoken to all these different people, when the customer ask a question like, why does this taste like this? You can give them a really rich story. You can say, well, it's because of this altitude and that makes it really difficult for the coffee to move from here to here. And this has all these implications. And generally, if customers have time, they like stories. Almost everybody likes learning something. They enjoy their food more when they know a little bit more about why it tastes the way it does. Uh, there, is, there is proof that the, the centers of the brain, you can, they've done this on MRI scanners, that when somebody understands how the thing was made, they enjoy it more because it directly links between the centers that hold knowledge 
and the centers that hold uh, taste, and that creates pleasure. And that's another kind of connection. I just like the word connection. I just want to say it a lot. I, I, what is the word for connection in Czech? Sorry? Spojka? Spoim? Spoim? <laughs> So this is something we will work on, and I will learn more, and we can build another connection, another spine. <laughs> so I think that is, that is all, I, all I have prepared, but I am happy to talk about it.